And we're going to turn now to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 as Blue reads our reading for us. Yeah. It reads, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others and it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Love never fails. Love always hopes. That word love there that Paul litters this passage with in Greek is agape, and it's a love that is the highest form of love we can have. It's a love that gives me what I need it may not be what I want, but it's what I need. It's a love that gives at personal cost to oneself. And it's a love that can be rejected. It's the love that we see from Jesus on the cross, showing us how much God loves us. And for me, I think what's really important about this word love is that it is an action word before it's a feeling word. We live in a world today where love is so much about feeling. or We're splitting up because we just don't feel it anymore. But for Paul, it's an action word. It's a word that I, I act, even if I don't feel it. Love always hopes. Um, last week, we celebrated my mum's 70th birthday. You can see her here with James Martin, the celebrity chef in our back garden. Um, I think he, she's more in love with him now than Cliff Richard. She talks about him all the time. Um, and we were monitoring the weather for the two weeks leading up to it because we had a few friends and family around in the back garden, barbecue, canapes, um, some fun games, and we were just thinking, I hope it doesn't rain on mum's birthday celebration. And sure enough, the one day in the week that it rained was that day, but only briefly. But we hoped that it wouldn't rain. That, that's not the word that Paul is using here for hope. That's kind of a, a weak version of hope, isn't it? Oh, I hope it doesn't rain, fingers crossed. When I was helping with one of our youth camps, my kids have just come back from our summer youth camp raving about how brilliant it was. But when I helped with one many years ago, um, there was a young lady on it um, called Jo Hills, and she was 17 years old. And I quite fancied her. And I flirted with her throughout the youth camp. I was a leader. She was a young person. I'd have been fired today, front page of the Daily Mail, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and quite right too. But at that point, um, she would um, wash my hair for me. I had luxuriant, well, it was thin, greasy hair, really, which is why I needed to wash. And she would wash my hair for me. I had to have my top off, you know, kind of trying to flex muscles I haven't got. Um, and I thought, I don't know if she fancies me or not. And we really weren't sure. So I was talking with the guys in my tent on the last night um, and about it. And they said, why don't we go and listen to her tent? So we all got up and we crept out and we went to her tent. And we all crept down like this. And we just listened. And there were six girls in their tent. They didn't know we were there. And we kind of listening. And, and one of them said, um, I, think, I think it's a really nice guy, Joe. I thought, thank you, Susie Foster. Praise the Lord for you. You're in my corner. And, and, and she talked a bit more, and they all talked. And then Joe said, but what about his legs? <laughs> and there was silence. There was silence in the tent, but I could sense the tension in my male companions as well, because they think, good point, I've seen his legs. You cannot swing a golf club like those things. They're, they're, they're so thin. And, and after the silence, one of them said, it doesn't matter about his legs. And Joe went, hmm. <laughs> and at that point, we all stood up and we stepped away from the tent. And all the guys shook my hand as if to say, well done, as if I'd done something. But I went into the week after that camp planning to ask Joe on a date, far more hopeful, because I'd received some information that maybe, in spite of my legs, she might go out with me. The word that Paul uses in the Greek for hope is to conf be confidently expectant. It's that, yeah, I believe this. It's not, oh, I hope it, it won't rain. It's a, yeah, I believe that when I ask Joe on a date, she will say yes. And look where it got me. This is what Paul means by hope when he says that love always hopes. 
I asked you this week for your answers to the question, what have you hoped for that didn't come to fruition? And one lady sent this in to me. Hi, Neil, I thought hard about whether to email you because this hit home and hoping for things that never come to fruition is something that is the subject of my heartache for me. In my late teens and early 20s, I dreamed of how life could be. Surely I would lead a normal life, settle down and have children until I left the church I grew up in and realised it would never be in that environment. Then in my late 20s through my 30s and early 40s, I still harboured hopes and dreams until health and age dictated that being a parent could no longer be a hope. However, it has also seemed that having a stable, long-lasting, loving relationship has also never come to fruition either. Another thing hoped for, not fulfilled. In the last 10 years, I've had to come to terms with this and also been diagnosed with incurable illnesses. First, I hoped I would be healed, but now I struggle with even the smallest shred of hope, as this also hasn't come to pass. I doubt myself, asking, has it not happened because I don't deserve it? Or I question, why does God think this is a better way for me, with what seem imperfectly natural desires unfulfilled, whereas I see others blessed completely with one or both, or well and healthy? Doesn't he, God, realise I'm living the nightmare existence I dreaded when I was young, alone and with severe illness? Hope unfulfilled can lead to a feeling of failure, heartache and existing rather than living. I try to focus on bringing the joy to others rather than dwelling on hope unfulfilled. But if I'm asked why I live my life, life I, I do, the cracks appear in my carefully constructed smokescreen and you will glimpse the pain. The challenge for me in the last few years is daring to hope for anything. Maybe I just don't feel I can have dreams anymore. I'm sure that shows a lack of faith and trust and maybe my heart's desires were the wrong ones. That's my story, one which I hope you will share anonymously if it is useful for you. When I got that email, I thought, well, I don't know that I want to share that. There's very little hope in this lady's story. And then as I reflected, I thought, well, actually, maybe she, to at least some degree, reflects other people's stories in our church family as well. Maybe some of us have given up hoping. Maybe some of us have had intense hopes that haven't come to fruition and we've buried them deep, but they still cause us pain. And then I reflected on my own life and thought, actually, I have hopes that haven't come to fruition as well. So how can we fit this lady's email with being confidently expectant, with hoping in God? I remember we had a guest speaker here a couple of years ago. It was one of the last times we had a live service where someone was preaching and he said something that stuck with me. He speaks around the country and he said, the largest growing denomination in Christianity in the UK is de-churched Christians. Christians that have given up hope in church, but not God, and have drifted from a church family. And as I read this lady's email, I thought, this is a lady who could easily do the same if we're not careful and how can we as churches help people to be confidently expectant when it's really tough for them I think a few things rose to mind for me one is I think we need to move on from a Sunday school understanding of the Bible which gives room for questions and discussion and mystery and wonder now I'm not saying we shouldn't have that Sunday school understanding sometimes sometimes I just need to say um, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. There are points in life where that childlike faith is so key and so important. But I wonder if a lot of people drift away because they think, you know, the, the, the sermons I hear, the Bible studies I have in my small group, the things I listen to online don't seem to delve really deeply into the tensions of that Bible passage. I don't know about you, but I find that often. I recently read the life of King David and King Solomon in the Bible, and they were always upheld. When I came to the end of those Bible passages over several months, I thought, I don't really like King David. He's not a very nice man. I know God loves him. I know God had a soft spot for him. 
But as I read the life he lived, it's not one that I would want to be read as my life when I come to the end of it. Not that I'm saying I'm better than David necessarily, but I'm saying I struggle with him as a person. And so do we in church, do we in our own reading of scripture, do we in our small and home groups actually delve beyond the simple questions to the uncomfortable things? There's a Bible study method called the Swedish Bible study method. I think it's from Sweden, obviously. And one of the questions they asked, there's five questions, and the last question is, what makes you angry in this Bible passage? It's a raw, honest question. And if we're always looking for neat, simple answers, we're never going to get to that question. So I encourage, I challenge you, in your small group, Ask those difficult questions that allow for discussion and mystery and wonder. I also think we need places where we fit and can share our struggles and pain. Um, For the lady in this email, she said it took her 10 years to come to terms with the truth that she wouldn't have a child. We need small groups in our church where people feel they can share that anger and angst and fear and pain. I think another thing we need is to explore doubt as a pathway to hope. In her email, she said that she felt guilty and she wondered if God really wanted this for her. Uh, Doubt has been sold to me over the years as a bad thing. Did people ever say to you, don't be a doubting Thomas? Thomas was always the the doubting one. But it was actually Thomas who met Jesus and Jesus said, you can put your fingers in my side and in the, the, the wounds here if you want when he was resurrected. He was the one that got closest physically to Jesus in that way. Doubt doesn't need to cripple us. Doubt can create room for more answers and a deeper relationship with God. Because those doubts won't go away. So we need to explore them on our own and in groups. And I think we need to continually revisit who God is and how much God loves us. When was the last time you, when was the last time I stopped and thought, Who is God? If I was sat in a coffee shop or a pub now with a friend and they asked me to describe God, what would my answer be? And has it changed at all over the years? And do I know that God loves me? That God loves us? In her email, this lady says, Maybe I'd got it wrong. Maybe I was hoping for the wrong things. Does God want a different path for me? I guess what I'm saying, guys, is if we want to have a hope, we need to embrace the doubts, the questions as well. Otherwise, that hope doesn't become solidified. My favourite sermon that I've read is seven words long, and it's this. God is love and life is unfair. God is love and life is unfair. It's a sermon that a guy stood up at a convention. They wanted an hour-long sermon. He just gave them seven words. And this sermon stayed with me because God is love. But life is also unfair. Listen to Will and Saskia's story. There were times when life was unfair. Listen to that lady's email. There were times when life is unfair. And if we're honest in this room online, there were times in our life when we think it's just not fair. Because we had plans and we had hopes and we had dreams and some of them we sincerely felt were from God and some of them definitely were. And life hasn't rolled out as we thought. That's not because God is some power-hungry tyrant in the sky moving us around like chess pieces, having fun with us, testing our faith to see if we still follow him. It's because in the midst of all of these difficult times, God still loves us and God is still there. Hoping for something doesn't necessarily mean it will come true. Plenty of people hoped for things that they did not see. Abraham, Moses led the people through the wilderness for 40 years and died before entering the promised land. And Paul had many hopes and dreams that didn't materialise in the New Testament. Just look at Paul's writing to the church in Corinth in chapter 11 of the second letter. Are they servants of Christ, he says. He's talking about these super apostles that say that they're brilliant and they've got all the answers. I am out of my mind to talk like this. 
I am more, I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. That's something you were given if you were being ceremonially unclean or you were stepping outside of traditional Jewish teaching. They would get you back in line if you were so severely out of line by whipping you 39 times. And Paul gets that five times. When you thought maybe by the third time, Paul would have thought, maybe I'll tone it down a touch. Maybe I'll get in line a little bit because these wounds on my back aren't healing as I'd hoped. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pouted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. Paul, maybe after the second time, don't get on a boat. But he still does it because he hopes that people will hear the gospel through him. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. Think of those people in Afghanistan fleeing. Think of that 18-year-old professional footballer hiding in an aeroplane and dropping to his death because he couldn't hang on. On the move all the time. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. Okay, Paul, we get it. You're in danger a lot. I have laboured and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. And these were external things that were going on for Paul. And just in the next chapter, Paul carries on and he says, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, I am strong. Paul by his life, seems to be saying, if you want easy sailing with God, if you want everything to be perfect, it's not going to happen. Life is unfair. People persecuting me from without and a pain, a thorn in the flesh from within that I've prayed three times that God would take away and I've not received that healing. Did Paul always hope? In all of his circumstances, I don't think he did. There were times when he said I was weak and I was desperate. I imagine he got angry sometimes, that he worried, that he doubted. But the theme tune of his life, over and above these dark, deep blips, was that love always hopes. That the Jesus that Paul met on the road to Damascus, the Jesus he'd hated that he fell in love with and worshipped as his Lord, reminded him that love always hopes. Love confidently expects. And so, friends, we place our hope in Jesus in all the difficult times we face, in the floggings and the shipwrecks and the bereavements and the beatings and the danger and the job fragility and the health scares, we place our hope in Jesus. How? Two suggestions. One is to follow the lady's email example and be honest with others about how we're feeling. So often we can be locked up in a prison of our own mind and our own heart and our own soul. People say to us, how are you doing? Fine. Now, I'm not saying we should unburden ourselves to random people we don't know in aisle five at Tesco. But do you have people that you know and love and trust? Share it with them. Rant, rave, talk, pray with them. And also, I think we place our hope in Jesus by praying honestly. I was praying a few weeks ago in the car. And I just blurted out at one moment, Jesus, I really want you to answer this prayer because it doesn't feel like you've answered some in quite a long time. I thought, oh, that's a bit rude. 
And I thought, no, actually, that's what I'm feeling at this point in time. And then I felt this relief. Actually, I'm being honest with you, Jesus. Please do answer this prayer. When do we place our hope in Jesus? When are we confidently expectant in him? It's easy in the high days and holy days. It's easy when the sun is bright. But where I got to in my thinking and praying was this. Love doesn't hide in hard times. It hopes. Love doesn't hide in hard times. It hopes. It's easy to hope when it's all good. But how about when our back's against the wall? When we're between a rock and a hard place? That's when we really need to show our hope in Jesus. Jesus, everything's crashing in around me, but I confidently expect that you are with me and you will somehow bring me through this. Holy Spirit, breathe that loving, expectant hope into my soul right now. Friends, let's pray together. Let's pray. As we have a moment of quiet, what is it that you have given up hoping for? Jesus, in these situations that have come into our mind, these people that have jogged across our hearts, Please help us to confidently expect and to trust you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I encourage you this week, each morning when you get up, just before you get out of bed, to think of that personal situation that you are going to hope for and to just do the sign of the cross with your four fingers. Just lay there in bed or sit there with a cup of tea and just say, Jesus, I'm going to confidently expect to see change in this situation or with this person. I place my hope in you because I love you.